Well, good morning and uh, welcome back. We are back in pandemic mode. I am very sorry to report we did have in-person worship services last week, uh, but due to an uptick in uh, virus uh, news this week, we've kind of cut back to just our YouTube uh, broadcast only. I uh, hope you'll be patient with us. We told you last week that that might happen, and gosh, it already has. Uh, we're going to probably plan to have uh, this type of media service uh, for the most of this rest of July. We'll be looking at it later in July to see how things are going, and hopefully we can get back to in-person services then as well. Uh, I really have no other announcements than that except for one thing. We were going to have communion this week, but with this sudden change, um, we're, we're going to plan that for next week, and uh, we'll try to get some information out to you, those who wish to have communion at home uh, using the special sealed cups, uh, make, a, make those available for you to pick up this week, and, uh, and, and you can take part in that for our next week's service. Uh, that's about all I have. So it is time to begin, and we'll begin with a word of prayer. If you can please bow, please, as we have our opening prayer. In awe and wonder, we meet you here, O God of prophets and our God. We have struggled with you in lonely places and praised you in the company of your people. We have cried out to you and you have shown your steadfast love. We have resisted you and you have drawn us back into the circle of Christ's disciples. Pour out your blessing on, on each one, we pray. Hear our prayers and renew our spirits. Amen. Our first reading today comes to us from the book of Psalms. It is Psalm number 46, and there are only 11 verses, so we will read all 11. And uh, we're beginning uh, with verse 1, of course. Uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall, God will help her at, day, at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what, God, what the Lord has done. The desolation he has brought to, on the earth. He makes war cease in the, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. May God bless the reading of his word in all who hear it this day. Well, it is that time of our service. If you were here, we would be sharing our joys and concerns, uh, our praises for God, for all God has done for us. We'd be lifting up our prayers uh, and concerns for those among us who need prayer. And I ask that you do that in your hearts today uh, as we come together for prayer. And, uh, and also maybe expand our prayers even beyond ourselves. We, um, we are celebrating the 4th of July weekend. There is much to celebrate as a free people. Uh, we understand that we are under the limitations of a pandemic and all the forces that go with it, the people out of work, the troubled people who are taking to the streets and all the things that seem to be happening that, that seem to make the headlines and the news. But we are still a free people and we still live in the greatest land, the greatest nation on earth. And our thankfulness for that to our God is something that we should all take part in. And I pray that as we bow before our God today, that you embrace your freedom, embrace the safety of this nation that you live in. Uh, understand that yes, it could be more perfect. <laughs> the imperfections come from us, the people who live here. 
And uh, as we look at how to make things better, it begins with our relationship with God. It begins with our heart, and it begins from within us to make all the world around us better. So let us go to prayer this morning before our God. Oh God, we ask your blessing upon us individually as we raise up praises of thanksgiving to you. We ask your healing and strength for those of us who struggle, uh, those of us who are facing things that are heavy burdens during this time, whether it is financial burdens or uh, from a loss of job, uh, whether there are other things happening that are making it more difficult during this time. Lord, we need your strength to make each day through. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon this church, this community of faith, we have made it now since the 8th of March. We know that we may have to go a little longer before we can be totally strengthened in, our, in each other's presence, but Lord, we are here to serve you. Keep, us, keep guiding us, showing us ways that, that we can be true to our mission in this world and be a beacon of hope to all those around in this community, all those who we reach with your word. And Lord, now we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second reading comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I hate the desire to do what is good. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I do, who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So if... if so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. May God bless the reading of his word. Uh, we had a tradition called the school picnic, and it would take place on the last day of school. No classes were held that day, uh, but all day long were all types of games and competitions and, all, and, and great food, and uh, it was a, a perfect day for me. And one of the things that we did is we had a tug of war. And that's where we had teams that are lined up and you had the long rope and you had the ribbon in the center and you would work so hard to try to pull one team uh, across the line or the other team win by dragging them across the line. As a young boy, that was my understanding of tug of war. As I got older, I understood tug of war a little bit differently. I understood that it might have uh, take on the um, dealing with other people who do not have the same ideas that I had. And, and certainly within myself, there was always this uh, 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 struggle, if you will, on doing what was good and doing what was bad. Uh, in, in the old days, and I have to go back to the old days because I'm an old guy, there used to even be commercials on television where there would be two people sitting on the shoulders. There would be an angel over here and, and a devil over here, and you would look back and forth, and you know, which are you going to do? There's this tug, tug of war. 
So there's always been this uneasiness within me and maybe within you as well. So I always looked ahead in my life to try to find a time when things would be easier because it must be my circumstances that are causing all this frustration or this tug of war or anything's going on. So as a young man in my teens, I looked ahead to when life might be better for me, easier for me. When I was on my own, when I had my own schedule, when I had my own car, my own place to work, uh, my, 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 uh, a good job, a full-time job, and my own place to live, then when I get there, life is going to be easy, and I won't have this tug of war anymore. I won't have this trying to figure out what I should be. Life is going to be easy. But when I got there, I found out that it wasn't so easy. There was still this tug of war. As a single guy, I had to get up early in the morning and go to work. I didn't like getting up early and going to work. The tug of war, even on the days that I knew I needed to go to work, would be, gosh, can't you just sleep in another day? There's nobody here to compete with that. There's nobody here to tell you to get up anymore. Your mom's not there. So the tug of war is, do I get up and do my job, or do I call in sick? All kinds of things happened when I was at that age. So I thought, you know, Really, this is not an easy time of life. I want to look ahead to when I won't have all this turmoil, this tug of war happening in my life. I want an easy life. So, you know, it's going to be easier when I get a little older and I meet somebody and I have a family and I have my own home and I have a nicer car and I have a better job. And so I got to that point and, and I'm, now I'm <laughs> where I think it's going to be easy street, that nothing is going to be a problem, that there won't be any more struggles, no more tug of war, no more turmoil, no more indecision, no, no more problems with what was right and wrong, uh, only to find out when I get there that there is more of the same. Just different things to make those decisions about. So I looked far out. I started to look farther out in my life to when I might have it easy. I looked to my retirement days, to when there would be free and easy, no worries at all. Nothing to ever bother me, nothing to be a hard decision. Right and wrong would be easy, no tug of war, nothing getting in the way. And then I find out that when I get there, there's always a tug of war. Paul says here, I don't understand myself. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't get that. I have given my life to Christ. I am a Christian. Can't all this just go away? And what happens to us is we sometimes misunderstand what becoming a Christian and coming into a relationship with God is all about. We are forgiven for our sins, all past sins, all future sins. Everything is covered. But that does not mean that there is not sin and temptation all through our life, all around us in this world. And it seems to infiltrate in every place we go. It goes something like this. I wake up in the morning and I have this great intention for the day. I am going to go out and I am going to spread sunshine and happiness wherever I go. People are going to be happy just because I'm around. Then I find out by 10 o'clock, I've upset the kids, I've kicked the dog, and I've given somebody that special wave who stole my parking plot, place. And I know that I don't want to do that. But yet I do. And that's what Paul is talking about. Is that you and I have this struggle within us. And this struggle is knowing what the right thing to do is. And then actually doing it. So he says one of the things he has to do, and I'm going to read a couple more verses, because he has an answer for it. And he has this answer for it. It, it's, it's, uh, it may sound simplistic, but, but please listen to it, and then I'll go back and, and I'll talk about it again. He says the answer for it is to go back to when I was saved. Go, go back to the Lord who saved me and understand that if he can save me from sin and death, he can save me from this situation I'm in right now. He can save me from this tug of war. He can, even if I should fail today, he can help me through tomorrow. And these are just the two more verses that I'm going to add to our reading today. And this is what he says about himself. What a wretched man I am. <laughs> Usually it's somebody else telling us that. We're not saying that about ourselves. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. 
I am dragging around all my old ways. I am dragging around the sin of the world. We live in a fallen world, and it seems that sin is all around us. The bad choices are all around us, and it seems to even seep into our pores, and we bring it up in, in almost every situation we are faced with. There is always a right way to go, and there's always a wrong way to go, and it seems like our human nature wants to drag us into that wrong way to go. The other thing Paul says is that it's not good enough to just know the rules. It's not good enough just to know the law. It's not good enough to know what God expects as an overall rule of how you and I are to live. What it counts is knowing what that law means to you personally. Because many of God's laws have individual meanings to each of us. Because it's in our in individual lives where the tug of war takes place. We don't all struggle and have a tug of war over the same issues. We do not all have the same weaknesses. We do not all have the same strengths. So what Paul is saying is that knowing the rules is not good enough. But knowing what that means in your life and, and what has to change in your life that you would serve God. And, and here's what I want to do and just, just show you just for a couple of minutes what I mean by that. You'll do much better on your own than I'm going to do, but I'm going to share this with you. And I have in front of me the basic laws of God, the Ten Commandments, okay? And I'm going to use them as an illustration of what Paul is saying. It's not good enough to know the law, but you must know what that law means to you, okay? And, and here, in some of this conversation we've already had over the last couple of weeks, so, so maybe I'll, I'll just relate it to that. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that nothing else in our lives should be more important than God. And we've had that discussion in, in a previous message. That law stands on its own. But for every one of us, what Paul is saying is that what does that law mean to me? What does that law look like in my life? What in my life is getting in the way of God being number one? That's what will be different for each one of us. That's what we are to identify when we get into this tug of war, these struggles of, of, of doing the right thing and, and, and serving God or not, is that what is it? What is it? Our, where is our weakness when it comes to that? Is it, a, is it money? Is it fame? Is it authority? Is it power? Is it a person? For each one of us, it may be different, but taking that law, taking God's law, and understanding the life application in my life is what helps me to win these tug of wars. Because I can't just say, yeah, I know the rule, but I don't keep the rule because I do my own thing. Okay, we'll go on, and we won't do them all. I'm just going to grab a couple out of here, and you, and you are welcome to do these as you see it. Thou shalt not kill the sixth commandment. And we might say, well, okay, that's the rule. I don't walk around carrying a gun. I don't plan on taking anybody's life. I don't plan on doing anything like that. So this law, I'm glad it's got it up there, but hey, it doesn't apply to me. I have no, ap I have no life application for that rule. And, um, and then we find out we do. We may not take someone's life physically, but we can take it in other ways. We can ruin their life gossip. We can ruin their life with just the way we treat them or don't treat them. We can take life in many, many different ways. This law applies to every one of us, and each one of us has to deal with it in our own way. Another one, the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Oh, I'm not a thief. I wouldn't break into your house. I wouldn't break into your garage. I wouldn't steal your car. But I might take some pens, might take some paper clips, might take some paper, might take some things that I can use from the office. What the heck? They don't, they'll never miss it. That's not stealing, right? That's part of my privilege of being there. Or other ways that it may apply to your life. God's law and how it applies to our life is where we have this struggle, this tug of war. And what Paul is saying, it's not good enough just to know the law. That's great. But how it applies to my life, because that's where the struggle will be. Shall not covet, the last commandment.
covet, want something of yours. Jealous of you, I wish I had your money, I wish I had your farm, I wish I had your what, yep, up, up, whatever you've got, I wish I had it. Not admiring you for having it, but I just wish I could take that thing and make it mine. Now we're going to say, well, nobody's got anything I want. Really? And then we start thinking about people we get jealous of because they have something we want. It's part of the struggle. You know, my, my friend who I sat next to and worked next to, all of a sudden he's promoted. And I'm sitting here thinking, wait a minute, what about me? I'm the one who should have got that job. I'm the one who is the better qualified person here. I am the one. I am the one. And it, it, it shows its ugly head in many different ways. Paul is writing the truth to us that you and I struggle in this world. He struggled 2,000 years ago when he wrote this. He'll struggle thousands of years from now with people who read this. This is a wake-up call for us to try to explain some of the uh, weaknesses in our lives so that we don't just turn away and say, well, this Christianity thing didn't work out because I wasn't able to live up to all the demands of Christianity. You and I, I wish we were perfect, but we're not. We are perfect in God's eyes because we have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. But the temptation to sin, the temptation to do things our own way, the temptation to allow our human nature to rule where God would once to rule is still there for all of us, and it will be there until our dying day. When we come to Christ and give our life to Christ, and we are saved, that is a faith-filled moment. But our life will continue to, be, to have with it this pressure of what I don't want to do, I am going to do. I'm going to mess up. I have messed up. I'll mess up again. And I'll sit there and I'll read this over as Paul has written it, and I'll go, man, I get you. Because I, I don't expect to ever hear some of the things that I've heard come out of my mouth. I don't ever expect to make any of the, of the uh, stupid mistakes that I sometimes make. I don't ever expect to hurt people in a way that I have. And I, and I, and I think, I would never do that. And then I do it, and I go, well, how, that can't have happened. How can I have done that? And then, and then I read this, and I say, yes, 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 you are absolutely correct. I am, a, I am just as you write in these last couple of verses we read, what a wretched man I am, because left on my own, I am. Left on my own, my own devices, I, I am not a good person. Without the influence of God in my life, I, I don't even like me, okay? He is saying that. He is saying that on our own, away from God, we are not going to do well. But even when we fail, even when we find ourselves doing those things that we should not do, or that we are appalled that we ever did. God is there to forgive us and to put us back on track and to strengthen us for the next time. I wish this weren't true about us. I wish that once you were saved, everything was cool. You could, there was, just like I said earlier, there was that time of life where there would be an easy life. There would be nothing uh, to worry about. There would be no struggles. There would be no tug of war. There would be no harsh decisions to make. There would be no temptation. There would be no sin. But that's not the way it is. We live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, there is there's all kinds of temptation. In this fallen world, there are all kinds of opportunities in this fallen world, the enemy of your soul comes to take from you the holiness that lives in you in Jesus Christ. He comes to take this from you and then to stand there and say to God and to you, see, it doesn't work. You and I are to be humble before God. You and I are to be faithful as much as we can before God. And when we get into these tug of war, when we get into these situations where, you know, we know what's right, but man, it's, it's tough for us to do. And so we ask for God's help and strength to get through that. Every time we do that, we'll be able to look back and say, Lord, wow, that was a close one. Better that than, Lord, I am so sorry for what I have done. I'm so sorry for who I have hurt. 
I'm so sorry for failing you. That's a prayer that I have to say way too often. And I pray that we do not have to, but, you know, we're human and we do. Read this verses of Paul. I pray that you will this week. It's in Romans 7. Uh, verses 15 through 23 is what we read in the beginning. And then I added two verses, the last two verses, 24 and 25, is where Paul gives us the answer to what we are facing. And I pray that you find these biblical answers for your own life. And, and as they are used in our own life, then we begin to change the world around us. So, I leave you now. I hope you've had an awesome 4th of July weekend. Uh, I know that there were many restrictions. Uh, you couldn't go hang out with a lot of the people you wanted to hang out with. Neither could I. And uh, we had to be a little bit more subdued than what we would normally would. But I have to tell you, we'll make up for it next year, okay? We'll do something really wild and crazy, and uh, it, it'll be fun. I pray that you can find peace in this pandemic. I pray that you do not take us closing this church as a major setback, because it is not. Uh, we're just being safe, as we told you about last week. That we, your safety and our safety is, is, is more important than, than risking, uh, uh, risking lives to, to be in person to worship God. God has made wonderful opportunities for you and I to worship and in, in some ways, uh, we are uh, actually reaching people today that we would not reach if we were open. So I pray for everyone who joins us, for everyone who prays for us, for everyone who keeps supporting this ministry because it, it, is, it is here, it needs your prayers, and, and uh, we know that someday we will be back together again. So let us pray, and we'll come to the close of our service. Dear God, we ask your blessing upon us as we uh, move on through our week. We, uh, we know you love us, Lord, and, and you know we love you. But there are days that, that it's tough for us to, to do the things we know that are right. And Lord, we, we ask for your strength and your blessing so that we might be the people that you wish us to be. And now we, we, we go on our way. Uh, we go out into the world to be with our families and friends and coworkers and share with them the love that you have shown us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And go in peace.